In just a moment, I'm gonna ask you to introduce yourself. You, you need to tell us your name, and then you can tell us whatever it is you wanted to tell us about this case. Okay? Yes, sir. We're going to give you 15 minutes to do that. That is Tennessee Court of Appeals Judge Stephen Stafford explaining the rules of procedure in appellate court. The light will turn green, and as long as the light's green, you've got plenty of time. The light will turn yellow when the time is beginning to run out, and the light will turn red when your time's used up. He's explaining what to expect at the podium, while a self-represented litigant argues their case, even going as far as explaining what the lights mean in front of them. Once we hear from you, we'll take this matter under advisement. In other words, we're not going to rule today like a trial court does. We're going to take the record, read the record, review your brief, and then we're going to write a written opinion which we will mail to you along with the other side. Yes, sir. Okay. Do you have any question about any of that? No, sir. All right. Are, are you ready to proceed? Yes, sir. Okay. I'm your host, Nick Morgan, Digital Media Lead for the Tennessee Administrative Office of the Courts, and welcome to Tennessee Court Talk. Joining me on today's episode is Court of Appeals Judge Stephen Stafford to discuss his role in the state court system and what you might call the softer side of the bench. Judge Stafford, welcome to Tennessee Court Talk. Thank you, Nick. For people who are listening who may not be as familiar with the appellate court system and the difference in a trial court and an appellate court, you serve on the western section of the Tennessee Court of Appeals. Can you tell us about your position? I am one of 12 judges on the Court of Appeals. We have four from each section, four from the west, four from the middle, and four from the east. We sit as one court, which means that uh, each judge, we all interchange. In other words, I can sit in the middle section or the eastern section, as can any judge. Uh, we're appellate court judges, which is a big difference uh, in the job responsibilities of uh, a trial court judge. Trial court judge, when uh, you, you think about uh, what you see on TV, uh, you see a, a judge with a jury, with witnesses, taking evidence, making decisions, uh, taking the jury's decision, perhaps in criminal cases doing some sentencing. Uh, we don't do that. In the appellate court, what we do is review the record from the trial court. And uh, that's, that's a word that has a lot of different meanings, but essentially the record is the transcript of evidence, which is the testimony that was presented in the trial court. And then we review the briefs that the parties submit. And we do our research. We look at uh, the decision of the trial court, determine whether or not it's supported by the evidence, and then write an opinion. So we don't render a decision like the trial court does. Normally the trial court will render an oral decision and then follow it with a written decision. The way the appellate court speaks is through its written opinion. In my role here at the Tennessee court system, uh, I live stream a few thousand appellate court cases per year. Uh, it's been my experience that you're known for being extremely approachable in the courtroom taking time before arguments to explain step-by-step step the procedures and protocols of the courtroom. Uh, you do that with both attorneys and litigants who are representing themselves, and you offer the opportunity to ask questions all the time. How would you describe your approach? When you have an appellate panel sitting, that's normally in the intermediate appellate court, you have three judges. One of the three judges is uh, denoted as the presiding judge. When I am the presiding judge, I have, I, t I approach things in that I am the manager of that hearing. And as the manager of that hearing, uh, it's my belief that the best way to get the best hearing is for everyone to understand the ground rules. And oftentimes when we have self-represented parties, they show up, perhaps they've watched some oral arguments in the past, perhaps they haven't. 
perhaps this is the first time they've ever been in an appellate court. So it's important for me to make sure that they understand what our procedure is and how we operate. Sometimes we have new attorneys or even older attorneys who've never appeared in the appellate court before. They have questions about the procedure. So it's, it's important for them to understand before we start how we operate. Uh, I believe we get a much better product if everybody's playing with the same set of rules. And it doesn't take any time for us to answer any questions that we can legally answer. If we can answer those questions, it doesn't hurt anything. Is there a difference in your approach between lawyers and self-represented litigants? I'm sure there is. Uh, I don't know that it, it is a, uh, a difference that I, I make uh, purposefully, but I'm assuming that the attorneys know uh, the rules, know the procedure. But if they don't, I'm, we're, I or any other judge uh, are very happy to help explain it to them uh, so that they, they, they can work through the process. Uh, I'm not as much surprised as a self-represented litigant who perhaps doesn't know the procedure or doesn't know how we operate. What about your experience as a judge over your career has influenced that approach? I've been uh, fortunate enough to be a judge at uh, basically all the different levels in uh, this state. Uh, when I first started, uh, or when I first became licensed as an attorney, I served for five years as a part-time city judge. Uh, I had general sessions criminal jurisdiction. So I got to really see the face of the public and the judiciary at that level. I subsequently had the opportunity to serve for a juvenile judge uh, for a year, and then I was a trial court judge for several years before I came to the appellate court. So many times you see people uh, come to court and they don't understand what's going on. They understand that they were required to be there. They were perhaps sued or perhaps they're subpoenaed. They don't know what's going on and they need to know. Uh, so they can make good decisions or as good a decisions as they possibly can under those circumstances. So I think the more knowledge that's out there, the better off we are. And again, the, better pro the best product we get is based on as much knowledge as we can share. One thing I've always found impressive with your approach to anyone standing at the podium in front of you is that you always seem to take that scariness of being in the position that person's in at a podium about to argue a usually bad situation in front of a panel of three judges. And you humanize that fear, and oftentimes I think that comforts them enough to present the best argument they can. First of all, I appreciate you saying that. You're very kind to say that. Uh, more likely than not, at whatever level of the court system that you're at, no one wants to be there. Nobody's in court to tell you, I'm having a great day. Things are going my way there are problems or you wouldn't be there. And to further exacerbate that situation, there are problems that the parties could not work out themselves, so they had to perhaps get lawyers involved. They certainly had to get the judicial process involved. So they're here. And they're here not because they like it, but because they perhaps need some relief or they're looking for an end to this litigation. So you, you need to keep that in mind. One of the things that uh, I was taught many, many years ago as a uh, new judge, and, and that is we are public servants. And we need to keep that in mind. We work for the public. They don't work for us. And sometimes as a judge, you can get that mixed up a little bit. Uh, if you think about it, the way judges are treated, you walk into a courtroom, everybody stands up. Uh, everybody, hopefully, is respectful of that position, and they should be. But 
you can get the wrong attitude about that if you're not careful. And the, the people who are in front of you are just as important. In fact, they're more important than we are because they're the reason we're here. We're trying to help them solve a problem. They may not like the way the problem gets solved, but we're an essential ingredient in getting all that resolved. When I was a trial judge, uh, I tried many criminal cases, civil cases with juries. And one of the things that I was taught by more experienced judges is that what we always need to do is respect the jury because the jury uh, is the finder of fact in uh, those type cases. So one of the things that, that I always did was when I had a jury, when I walked in the courtroom, everybody stood up. But I also asked everybody to stand up when the jury walked in because they needed to be accorded the same level of respect that I did because they were doing the same job that I was supposed to be doing. What would you say to someone that is either a self-represented litigant or even a new lawyer that is scared of the outcome of their case or that is scared about even standing up there in front of you and don't fully understand or have processed the rules of procedure in appellate court? Again, it's a process. This isn't a big mystery. It shouldn't be a big mystery. It is a big mystery to some people, but it shouldn't be a big mystery. Uh, it, it is a very formal dispute resolution process. It has rules and it has procedures. And I think that it is part of our job to make it as accessible as we can make it within the boundaries, the parameters. Sometimes we can do things that make it easier and make it more understandable. Sometimes we can't. When we can, we should. It doesn't take any more effort. We've mentioned a little bit about my role here in the Tennessee court system. As of 2020, all appellate court proceedings are live streamed. Has that influenced your approach at all? I, I know that I'm very conscious of live streaming and I think live streaming has some positive aspects for instance it opens the courts anyone who has an internet connection can watch anything going on in the appellate courts in Tennessee I think that's a positive thing uh, and I, I have actually am very much surprised at uh, how many people do watch appellate arguments. I have people who mention it to me on occasion, and frankly, I'm surprised because I, I don't know what why they do it, but I, I'm happy that they do do it. So I think that's a positive thing. I think that it also makes the judges very conscious of the fact that what they say uh, and what they're doing is being broadcast worldwide uh, as it's happening. So uh, I, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. I just know it is a thing. The downsides, I don't know. I don't know that we know yet what the downside is to live streaming, but I would feel very comfortable that there probably are some they just haven't manifested themselves yet. Judge Stafford, I've always had so much respect for you, watching you for many years, show the utmost respect to those before you. Thank you so much for sitting down with me for a few minutes today and taking some time to explain your approach to humanizing the bench. Thank you, Nick.